a Jew. How many are there? Where and under what conditions do they live? It is not far-fetched to imagine that these queries were posed by the team of social scientists, or their consultants, who created the questionnaire behind the 2013 Pew study of American Jews, but these specific questions were not. So they, they were not posed by the Pew study uh, social scientists. Instead, they were formulated by Alfred Nosig, a German Jewish social scientist who in the late 19th and early 20th centuries wrestled with what being Jewish meant. In his 1903 Jüdische Statistik, Nosig considered the questions of Jewish identity and survival. As historians have suggested, Nosig was a social scientist with a mission. He wanted to study the, the sort of fact that Jews in his mind um, in the diaspora were experiencing a degeneration and suggested the possibility of regeneration through a return to the healthy conditions of Jewish Palestine. Alfred Nosig was not alone. He was part of a larger group of German Jewish demographers, anthropologists, physicians, and political economists who used the disciplines of social science to make sense of the enormous changes experienced by modern Jews. He lived within a world in which Jews already served as objects of classification and enumeration. Governmental agencies and bureaucracies, as well as private groups, had long drawn on descriptive statistics, history, ethnography, anthropology, and medicine to generate numerical data on a wide range of issues pertaining to Jews, matters as disparate as economics, geography, population, crime, and labor. Census data, for example, drawn as early as 1871, established that of approximately 41 million inhabitants in the newly unified Germany, there lived half a million Jews, a significant number of them in the country's largest cities. The latter point of information seemed to be a somewhat new trend. Until the middle of the 19th century, many towns had denied settlement to Jews. With legal equality of emancipation, rights of residency were lifted. Now, citizens were guaranteed freedom of domicile and German Jews moved. Each subsequent census suggested that even larger numbers of German Jews were now living in cities. Between 1871 and 1914, for example, more than 100,000 Jews moved to Berlin, producing a fourfold increase in the Jewish population there. Alongside these governmental agency studies, there also existed classification and enumerations of Jews conducted by non-Jews. Medical studies, for example, published during the same decades, offered conflicting information concerning Jewish men's likelihood to contract certain diseases because of their circumcisions, their supposed tendency to abstain from alcohol, or their sexual proclivities. German Jews then had long been a topic of interest to non-Jews for a wide number of reasons. The classifications and enumerations of them could be experienced by German Jews as particularly vexing, or affirming. The former was especially the case in 1916 when the German military high, com high command would mandate a census of German Jewish military service. And ironically, of course, that data was actually gathered by German Jews and while never formally published, showed that Jews did serve in larger numbers. But beginning in the late 1800s, there's a new trend, namely Jewish social scientists like Nosig who begin to publish in large numbers Jewish statistical research projects. Their sponsors often included Jewish communal and extra communal institutions. One of the first was the 1871 study of the Jewish communities of Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Switzerland, studied, sponsored by the Synod of Augsburg. It was quickly followed by a survey conducted by the Bnei Brith Lodge of Mannheim. The Bnei Brith Lodge was interested in financial matters, the Synod in demography. The Synod wanted to set out to determine how many Jews lived in these countries, where they lived, and how they affiliated. The Bnei Brith Lodge investigated the general sort of influence of economic factors on the occupational structures of rural Jewish populations in Baden. 
Starting in 1879, the Deutsche Israelitische Gemeindebund, or DIGB, published an annual statistical yearbook on German Jews. By 1903, these yearbooks now came under the auspices of the Freiner für Jüdische Statistik, or the Office of Jewish Statistics, whose Journal for Jewish Dem Demographics and Statistics, like the DIGB yearbooks, are housed upstairs um, in the Leo Beck. As Mitch Hart and others have shown, the Office of Jewish Statistics, unlike the DIGB, was sympathetic to, if not motivated by, Zionist leadings, something that we can kind of talk about later. Jewish social science, then, emerged as one means of understanding fundamental shifts in the conditions of European Jews. For German Jews, the issues that they wished to study were multifold and diverse. They included topics that were time and space specific and others that seemed to transcend specific moments in time. And it's to some of these issues that I want to turn to next with a few caveats. First, I was asked to kind of identify what would be some of the issues that the Jewish communities of Germany would have been interested in asking of themselves, right? Like if there had been a study, what would they wanted to have known about? Um, and that sort of implies that there are a host of issues that they wouldn't have wanted to know more about. Um, and so the question of whether or not they would have engaged explicitly with anti-Semitism, I think is a really interesting one. Because often, as we'll talk about in a moment, uh, German Jews approach the topic of anti-Semitism in a really circuitous way. The second, and I'll be really curious to hear more from uh, Dr. Cohen in a moment, it, the numbers that I will cite and the statistics that I will cite are fundamentally flawed. Um, questions of methodology uh, uh, were problematic at best, and how, the, how they gathered data and whether they even gathered the data that they cited that they gathered um, is something that can be contested. And so I appreciate that we're going to be looking at numbers themselves that are, that are vexed, uh, vexing at best. So late 19th century German Jews um, wrestled with the question of population size. Many of their own surveys, or surveys that um, they sponsored indirectly, uh, sort of explicitly engaged with Nozick's question of how many are they and where are they located. Um, their answers were troubling. Their numbers were dwindling. Jewish communal leaders expressed concerns over survey data that established that between 1871 and 1910, the German Jewish population was growing only by about 20%. This offered a sharp contrast to the general non-Jewish population, which was growing approximately by 58% during the same time period. Jewish married couples were allegedly having fewer children, and their marriage rate was slightly decreasing. Moreover, at the same time, um, this sort of 58% growth of the non-Jewish general population was increasing naturally. The Jewish minority only grew because of Jewish immigration into Germany. It's not surprising then that emigration, immigration, and marriage trends seem to be the three topics of, of tremendous interest for Jewish social scientists. Even after the creation of the German Empire and with it the emancipation of all German Jews, a significant number of Jews continued to leave the German-speaking world to go overseas. Some, particularly those escaping Alsace, Posen, and West Prussia, fled from adverse living conditions. Others left Germany to join the German-speaking Jews who had already gone to the United States between 1840 and 1870. As these Jews were leaving Germany, others were entering its borders. Many of the three million Jews fleeing Eastern Europe between 1880 and 1914 made their way through the German Empire. A number managed to remain in Germany. These Ostjuden did not necessarily share the same language, culture, religious traditions, or economic class as their Jew German Jewish hosts. Moreover, anti-Semitic agitation exploited the transmigration of Eastern European Jews to encourage panic. Organizations such as the DIGB, Bureau for Jewish Statistics and Jewish colonization organizations crafted surveys that not only helped them to quantify the number of immigrants, but also allowed them to think through the potential for immigrants' acculturation 
or the possibility for them to move elsewhere. So we have these sorts of studies of looking at how, you know, what are Eastern European occupation patterns um, in parts of Germany, or similarly, how are Eastern European immigrants faring in other places, let's say, like in Argentina. Similar to the focus on mobility and movement, social scientists were concerned about marriage. At a time when German Jewish communities already were seeing a decrease in the number of marriages between Jews, German Jews witnessed a rapid increase in intermarriage. With the establishment of civil marriage in the German Empire in 1875, marriage between Jews and Christians became possible without a religious conversion. Survey data revealed that many Jews took advantage of the civil marriage to non-Jews. Between the years of 1911 and 1915, supposedly 22% of Jewish men and 14% of Jewish women entered into a, mac, a mixed marriage, and more women um, than men converted to the partner's religion before marriage, um, if, if that was the case. According to the survey data, mixed marriages produced lower fertility rates than in Jewish marriages, and fewer than 25% of the children born into them were raised as Jews. Was intermarriage a result of emancipation, of entering the German middle class, a natural consequence of the dwindling observance levels of Jews outside of the Orthodox uh, Jewish communities? Not surprisingly, survey literature considered these two important trends, namely the rapid movement of German Jews into the bourgeoisie and the changing patterns of observance levels. Surveys investigated Jewish economic advancement, occupation trends, education patterns, and mobility, among other variables. They also studied attitudes towards dietary laws, observance of the Sabbath and holidays, the celebration of Christmas, and trends of affiliation. Some social scientists estimated that while fewer Jews kept the Jewish dietary laws, the number of Jews who attended a Passover Seder stayed stable. Um, and we see similar language in discussions about the Pew study, so totally fascinating, I think. Most Jews, they argued, identified with liberal Judaism or gave up religion. Moreover, Jewish observance could be place specific. Even though it saw a shrinkage in its population, for example, rural Jewish populations remained more likely to observe religious traditions. Interest in religious observance, population data, and intermarriage allowed Jewish social scientists to engage with questions about emancipation and assimilation. As such, it encouraged them to wrestle with the very question of who it was that they were defining as Jewish. When Nosig and his colleagues asked, who is a Jew, they faced a daunting paradox of the modern age in which they lived. On the one hand, the Jewish social scientists wished to shift the focus of their research from Judaism to the Jewish people, from religion to the Jewish folk. They refuted the idea that Jews could only could be reduced or limited to a religious identity and community only. Yet, on the other hand, this could potentially pose a challenge to these social scientists. Professor Cohen can speak to this for far greater, with far greater expertise than I can, and I'm looking forward to this discussion about how, with Pew, they thought through the question of how to, how to identify who was a Jew in this survey. But Jewish social science methodology in the late 19th and early 20th century was still evolving to catch up with these premises. Um, it was difficult for them to focus their studies on this question of who was a Jew without relying on established synagogue or communal registries or lists. How then could they begin to expand their surveys to include a broader definition of who was a Jew without relying solely on the Jewish communities to provide them with the information about who should be counted? Where was the researcher supposed to find his or her Jews? How could they track the unaffiliated? In the early 20th century, this would mean sending surveys to members of Jewish athletic clubs, social societies, and musical groups, among others. So a lot of this data then is done via these sort of questionnaires, right, which is very different than, as I imagine, from studying the Pew, and I would love to hear more, but how they actually sort of get the data, which was to, I assume, pick up the phone and call people. 
how disparate Jews, Jewish communal institutions, and Jewish extra-communal organizations responded to these social scientific enterprises is something we can discuss as we move into tonight's conversation. But clearly, when communities were pushing these surveys forward, they were trying to present themselves in a specific way to the larger community, right? So they're, they're asking very specific questions, and I'll be curious to hear from Professor Cohen sort of how it is that the Pew study um, may have differed from some of the Jewish communal surveys that he's been involved with. It's striking to note some of the commonalities of the late 19th and early 20th century German Jewish findings with some of the data that we learned about in 2013. It's probably just as interesting to note some of the discontinuities of the answers posed to the questions posed by Nosig. Who is a Jew? How many of them are there? And where and under what conditions do they live? Thanks. So I, I very much enjoyed that presentation because um, I know nothing about German Jews. I think my father would say you should know, you should be lucky to know as much as she forgot. Yes. So I really, really appreciate uh, how much, uh, how much you know, breath you brought to that conversation. I also appreciated the extent to which you provided me personally with uh, a sense of um, my own continuing a, a great history um, not necessarily great social science, but social, sci social scientists who, who applied their craft to the study of Jews for the purposes of helping the Jewish people. And, and something that, that speaks to me personally as someone who's done this, it looks like, I think for half a century. I'm 67 years old. I started when I was 19 at Columbia University. So um, what I want to do is I want to give a few highlights to offer some parallel to those questions, you know, who are the Jews and what's, what's happening to them, where are they going, and so forth. And um, my, my first, um, my first uh, takeaway, I hope, well, help, you'll take it away, um, is that, uh, when you, that if we speak about Jews, we cannot speak about you know, the Jews. I mean, this, you know, we know this. Uh, we can't speak about 6.7 million Jews, but we have to speak about different types of Jews. And as you, as you well know, there are two types of people in the world those who divide the world into two, and those who don't. So I would like, I, I'm in the second category. I always prefer to divide things into at least to three, actually three or more, but the three is very good. And when we, when we talk about American Jews, we need to think about three groups, each one of which may be subdivided, but you know, in, 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 in broad strokes, on the, on the one hand, uh, my right could be your right, uh, we have, we have you know, the Orthodox themselves can be divided into modern and Haredi, and the Haredi can be divided into Litvish and, and, and Hasidic. But let's just talk about the Orthodox. On the left hand, and here I have no good name, partially Jewish, nominally Jewish. Um, someone once came up with the word Gino, uh, Jews in name only. Um, or, and uh, actually a an alum, alum of, of our school came up with the idea of, of um, uh, the end of um, Gone with the Wind. Which is, uh, who, was the, who was the actor? Clark Gable. But who, who was the character he played? Uh, Rhett Butler. Butler, yeah. So it was, it, was, it was Rabbi Salkin who came up with the notion of Rhett Butler Jews. Why? Frankly, I don't give a damn. But so. <laughs> so, so we could have a little, you know, contest here, you know, name those Jews. But that group of people who in various ways say, I'm proud to be Jewish, I'm Jewish, um, and hardly do anything Jewish or you know, hardly have Jewish uh, uh, friends. Uh, to, 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 to some extent, they're Jews of no religion, uh, but that's not en entirely correct. And then in between the nominally Jewish and the Orthodox, um, is the engaged Jewish middle. And my major takeaway from the Pew study is that the, the Jewish middle is shrinking. Not, not this middle, but the, the, middle, the middle of the Jewish population. Um, there is a, a massive decline in the number and in the fraction of the population that falls into the engaged Jewish middle. And that's to me, is the major thing. It's the engaged Jewish middle that supports um, and populates and uses all the wonderful, you know, many of the wonderful institutions that we, that, that we know about, you know, from JCCs, uh, Centers of Jewish History, um, synagogues, uh, federations, 
Um, the, the Israel lobby on the left, the Israel lobby on the right. I mean, th this, is, this, is, this is that group that, that has been doing all that, and it's, uh, it's shrinking in size. So let's explain why. And this is uh, in the way that um, um, my German Jewish predecessors might also have been able to, able to do. First, let's talk about the Orthodox. Um, the Orthodox, as they, and, they, as they, and they vary, and, and there are variations there. The, the Orthodox have, um, are, uh, are distinctive among Jews and in America because they do a, a number of demographically special things. First of all, they get married. Second, they marry quickly. Um, third, they marry Jews quickly. Um, and third and fourth, they stay married. And they, um, and they have lots of kids. Um, so a as a result of all those, and I can give you the numbers, but as a result of all, all those features, um, the Orthodox population has been expanding phenomenally. Uh, um, um, Orthodox Jews constitute 10% of all Jewish adults, 27% of all Jews under the age of 18, and 35% of all Jews under the age of five. Right? Now, that's mostly to their credit, but we're going to talk about the other Jews who are declining in number, but, um, but that, that, that's part of it. Um, I, I did a study in 2011 of the New York area Orthodox, uh, Jews. Uh, I found there were about 115,000 more Orthodox Jews in 2011 than there was in 2002. And then I also found there are 115,000, in the nine years, there are 115,000 children under the age of 10. They said basically, just, they just added the kids. And he said, well, well why didn't they die? Um, well, w one reason is that there, was a, there were a very small number of Orthodox old people. So, um, uh, and so a small number died in the 10-year in the ten, ten period. And, and they were compensated by the small number who kind of wandered into Orthodoxy. You know, they, you know, they weren't, and then, then, they, then they were. Bali Chuva and others. So, this is fairly, fairly typical, and I'm, I'm calculating that the Orthodox should double roughly every 20 years. In New York, in, in, in London, in B'nai Brock, I mean, this, is a, this is a worldwide phenomenon. In Israel a few years ago, there was a, a Haredi rab, rabbi, I should get the name, who you know, passed away. It was, he was 106. He lived, lived a long life. And Haaretz reported that there were 1,400 descendants at his funeral. You know, so if he, if he yelled out, Yossi, and there'll be 50 great-grandchildren would show up, right? Because they, they don't know which one. But, but it was really, uh, it's, it, uh, this is an astounding story, but it's, it's told for effect. So you should remember, remember, but the Orthodox are really expanding. What about the non-Orthodox? Whereas the Orthodox have a fertility rate of roughly 4.1, um, the non-Orthodox have a fertility rate of 1.7, uh, which is below replacement. Two, we need 2.1 for replacement. We're, we're talking about 1.7. 1, 1. The 1.7, 1. though, isn't all good news because a, a, a lot of the 1.7 are non-Jews. They're being raised as, raised as non-Jews. Now, why are they being raised as non-Jews? What, 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 what could possibly be the reason that Jewish parents should have non-Jewish children? Da, 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 da. Intermarriage. <laughs> Jewish people marry non-Jews, and, and, and a Jew and a non-Jew get together, they love each other, and they make, they make decisions about how they want to raise, raise their children. Um, so um, uh, the, 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 well, the good, I wouldn't put quotes, the good news is that uh, whereas in my generation, maybe a third or even less of intermarried couples raise their kids as Jews, to today's generation looks like 60% of the children of intermarriage, the you know, kids in the 20s, um, are, are identifying as Jews. That's actually, for the population, that's, that's really good news. Um, and I'll tell you why. Actually, that, that expands the population. And the reason is that, um, that uh, you only need 50% in order to get an expanding population. And the reason for that is when two Jews marry each other, you use up two Jews at a time. But when a Jew marries a non-Jew, you only use up one Jew at a time. So, so if, you know, if you know, Sammy and, and, and Christine marry, and if um, uh, uh, Louise 
and uh, Chris marry over here. We only need one of them to produce Jewish children, and, you know, we're, we're even. And we're getting not 50%, but 60%. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, but. But the 60% aren't all... Well, here, here gets, gets that question. How do we define Jews? The, the Pew, Pew study, and I worked with them, tested different ways of asking questions to find out if you're Jewish. And, this, and the way they picked was the maximal way to get Jews to be Jewish. It turns out, and the question, they started with religion, which I was against, but I listened to the results. They started asking people their religion. What's your religion? They give them a list. Jewish is one of them. And then everybody, but for the people who did not name a religion in particular, um, they asked the second question. Aside from religion, do you, do, you, do you consider yourself Jewish, partially Jewish, or non-Jewish? So if you have no Jewish religion, you, you have, sorry, you have no religion, um, and you said that you are Jewish or partially Jewish, you're counted as Jewish, and that later became known as JNRs, Jews of no religion. Um, and no religion is a big, big, big category. Um, now, half of these people are partially Jewish, and half, half of these people are Jewish, um, the ones who are the, the Jews of no religion. So the 60%, you've got, you've got, and sorry, and of the 60%, half are Jews by religion, half are Jews by no religion, and of the Jews no religion, you know, 15 are partially Jewish, 15 are fully Jewish, but no religion. It turns out that Jews of no religion have a very low sustainability rate. They stay Jewish, that's not a problem. Um, the problem is that two thirds of their children are non-Jewish, are raised non-Jewish. Um, so what we're seeing is the, the effect of intermarriage is not only to, to produce more, uh, uh, l less engaged Jews and less educated Jews, which is what intermarried families tend to do, um, uh, but they also produce people who don't stay Jewish and who have an enormously high rate of intermarriage. Um, the, uh, the, something like 90% of the children of the intermarried marry non-Jews in turn. And it turns out that if you, and, 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 I, and now we now have two studies, Pew and another one that I'm working on. We find out that when a, when a, when a Jew marries a non-Jew, the chances that their grandchildren will be Jewish is down to 8%. The grandchildren of the intermarried. Not, not the grand, you know, if, if you're, you're an, many, many of you, are, I assume, are in married Jews, I'm making an assumption, New York, New York, yeah, it's a good, good assumption. Um, um, if you, not your, but if your ch child is uh, intermarried, the chances are that your great-grandchildren will be, you know, almost for sure will be non-Jewish. Um, you know, 8% are, are raised as Jewish, uh, Jewish by religion. So, um, so what's happening? This intermarriage phenomenon, which has now grown, it's, you know, leapt by, you know, by leaps and bounds, um, is now, uh, you know, to the extent that, you know, 40% of the children of uh, people of the children raised conservative marry non-Jews, and 80% of reformed Jews marry non-Jews. 72% of all non-Orthodox Jews. So, um, so what's happening is that you have the, this intermarriage engine operating alongside the Orthodox phenomena, and as a result, you get smaller numbers of engaged Jews who are not Orthodox, and larger numbers of these Jews in name only, primarily because of intermarriage. And then you have a whole bunch of other people who are, who are formally Jewish. And when I, one of the saddest days of my life was October, actually it was September 30th of 2013 when I got the results, and, uh, and I found out that of 7.2 million people who have a Jewish parent, 2 million, 2.1 million do not identify as Jewish. To me, that I, I was I'm part of a minion organized by my wife, an HUC rabbi, Rabbi Marion Lev Cohen. And at the minion, I, I asked if we could say a mishaberach. I mean, I was really very deeply saddened. I said, we should make a mishaberach for sick American Jews. American Jewry is sick. This is, and, and we're losing people. And it's about time that, you know, we, we recognize that and so forth. So that, so that, um, that has set up a situation in which we pretty much, if you look at my, let's say, quote, my generation, and I'll identify 50 to 69, I'm 67, and then look at the next generation, 30 to 49. <laughs> What's happened is that overall, among non-Orthodox Jews, the next generation is only two-thirds the size of my generation, 
and it has lower rates of involvement such that on almost any statistic that you can look at, caring about Israel, belonging to a synagogue, giving to the Jewish organization, whatever you want to pick, the, the sheer number of younger generation Jews who do that is one half of this number over here. So you, you look around and you, and you see Jews aren't, you know, Jew, uh, there are fewer Jews coming to events. The Jews who come to events are older. Um, and, uh, uh, and synagogues are merging. And, um, you know, so, so basically we're getting, and, and we're, and we're getting fewer and fewer members. Um, and then people start blaming the rabbis and others, never professors because we're not responsible for anything, but they, they, they blame rabbis and they say, you know, you have to be more meaningful. You know, we need better education, this and that. And I'm saying, wait, no. We're, actually, we're doing very well among the people who are in married, and we're doing just as well or poorly as, as we as we's always used to among people who are, who are intermarried, and we have huge numbers of non-married. Um, 50% of Jews 25 to 39 years old are non-married. It's really, it's just an, an, an enormous number. Non-married and intermarried Jews are about equally uninvolved in Jewish life. The, the, the reason they're not involved is they don't have a Jewish romantic partner in the house um, for one reason or another reason. Um, and, and, that's, and that is, you know, there are fewer, fewer Jews, fewer Jews married to Jews, fewer Jews therefore active in Jewish life, and it's not a problem of declining meaning or poor education. Um, in fact, all that stuff actually, you know, education actually works, but we're in a period of, of, uh, of shrinkage of that, of, that, of, that, of that Jewish middle. So the last thing I want to just uh, put on the table is not only do we have a challenge of demography, which results, so, you know, it relates to meaning and everything else, but the, 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 last, the last point is that uh, we have a cultural shift, and then I'll, I'll open up for conversation. Um, my generation uh, busted the norms. My children's generation broke the boundaries. Ju Judaism consists of norms, like a, you know, a, a roof, and boundaries, our walls. So my generation, read the Jew within that I wrote with Arnie Eisen, we, we created the sovereign selves. We, we can decide when, where, and how, and if to be Jewish. Um, the next generation, in part because of the rampant intermarriage, has said, you know what? I can be Jewish with non-Jews. Uh, and I'm doing, I'm doing interviews right now with, with, with uh, millennial people, and they're telling me something that's really interesting. Not only are, you know, are all their, um, almost all their romantic partners non-Jews, but they're saying, I like being Jewish, I want my children to be Jewish, and I can, I can have Jewishly committed children just as much with a non-Jewish partner as with a Jewish partner. And I am, this to me is a, 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 a scientifically a wonderful finding. I'm so proud of myself that I've uncovered this finding. But as a, as a, as a committed Jew who's worried about the Jewish future, who think, I know a few things about the Jewish future, to me this is a, 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 shall we say, a major challenge to the future of American Jewry. And, and now we can talk about how to respond to that challenge and how we can learn from our history so that we can have a better future. Thank you very much. What we've just heard from Steve is what I would call a typical Jewish telegram. <laughs> a, a Jewish telegram is one that says, start worrying, letter follows. Uh, actually, I think what Steve told us, which was really a incisive uh, uh, retelling of the uh, Pew findings, uh, what Steve told us was more dismal than a Jewish telegram uh, because it wasn't simply a message to start worrying uh, I, except for the last minute and a half um, I think this was a uh, description of a fate that none of us would want and that is the disappearance slowly of most of what we now know as the Jewish community, except, of course, for the Orthodox. Uh, certainly the shrinkage. Uh, nothing disappears entirely. Uh, we're talking about historical processes here. But certainly the transformation of the face of the American Jewish community into something that today we would not recognize. Uh, there is, in fact, a 
uh, astonishing similarity between the trajectory that German Jewry uh, traced in the uh, five decades after emancipation um, and before the Nazi putsch in 33, and the trajectory that American Jews have traced since World War II. Uh, uh, a trajectory of increasing acculturation, of increasing intermarriage, uh, of increasing individuation, uh, of increasing mobility, not just to the big cities, but to uh, occupations and geographic areas where Jews didn't used to be, um, uh, in, both in Germany and in the United States. What we've also seen is a movement away from religious identification, by and large. The, the Orthodox are a special case, clearly, but the movement away from religious identification towards some kind of identification uh, of an ethnic uh, sort, uh, identification with um, ancestry um, with belonging to an ethnic community. Um, uh, uh, the, the German term is Stamm, uh, and uh, as we all heard two nights ago from Michael Brenner, uh, uh, he proposed a category of Germanness that uh, was based on the Yiddish Stamm. Uh, uh, and um, Stammbewusstsein, a, a consciousness and a awareness and identification with one's ethnic heritage, which is in fact what the Pew study has been showing us. Um, it's not that Jews are ceasing to be Jews, it's not that Jews are ceasing to be Jews, it's that they're ceasing to be religious and increasingly identify themselves, whether they attend synagogue or not, they identify themselves as uh, Jews because of their ethnic and cultural uh, sense of belonging. That they don't deny. In that sense, it's very different than the assimilation of 150 years ago, when uh, the Heinrich Heine assimilation, for instance, of uh, becoming like everyone else and ceasing to be Jews. Um, I think uh, uh, America offers a, a possibility uh, that allows us to both acculturate and to remain Jews, in an ethnic sense at, at the very least, uh, uh, for a minority of us in a religious sense as well. Um, so there's a limit to the comparisons that we want to make. And I have to con confess that uh, for most of my life, I ran away from this comparison like from the hills. I mean. I, why? Because we know what the fate of German Jewry was. And to make the comparison is to at least invite the question, if not even give the answer, that won't American Jews go the same way? Um, so I guess the first question is, even before Trump, uh, was there a reason to worry that American Jews would go the same way, or was there not? Were, was America exceptional in that sense too? Was there a sense that uh, we, we don't necessarily, uh, we don't need to follow the same trajectory, the same fate? Um, Robin? Uh, so, 
I do want to push back a little on one little thing that you pointed out, and, and a couple of you in, in the room know this too. So uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century, we see many dramatic changes among German Jews, and, and you mentioned a number of them. One thing that has always fascinated me about German Jewry in the late 19th and early 20th century, well, there are many things that fascinate me, but among the many things that fascinate me, one of the things that fascinates me is that actually there isn't that much Jewish occupational change in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, there's a lot of mobility, there's acculturation, there's the development of this ethnic sense of self, um, but on the whole, those Jews who were involved in trade remained involved you know, in the family trade. Those Jews who were part of the liberal professions pre-1871, their children are often in the liberal professions. And of course, there are exceptions to the rule, but we don't actually see the dramatic shifts in the late 19th and early 20th century in sort of occupational trends that we might have imagined we'd see given everything else. Um, so I throw that out there because I, I, I find that to be such an interesting phenomenon. Um, like you, I tend not to backshadow. Uh, and so while I think there's real value in comparison, um, I don't ever want to uh, sort of take the advantage of hindsight and, and, um, and, and backshadow onto a moment um, because that's not what I do. I'm a historian and I sort of dig into the moment uh, that, I'm, that I'm studying. You asked, you know, even before Trump, was there a reason to worry um, and, and should we look at German Jews as worrisome? I make, I make the argument and, um, you know, I, I, I made the argument uh, in a number of articles and in, in my first book that Weimar was wonderfully tolerant. Um, and, and I still hold to that. Um, there were some incredible moments of intolerance. I cede that too, don't, don't you worry. Um, but there were trends of toleration that I think were exceptional. Um, and so when we backshadow, we don't see those moments of toleration. Um, were there things to worry about vis-a-vis -vis the German Jewish trajectory? Yes, I think so. But I don't think that those had to do with the with the rise of the Nazis and um, what takes place with that Nazi rise to power and then most importantly perhaps their consolidation of power. I think um, the concerns had to do with this Jewish community that if what matters to us, and I'm a historian so I'm not sure that I can say that it matters to me as a historian, I think it matters to me as a active member of my Jewish community and the mother of two Jewish boys. Um, but, uh, but I think what, what was worrisome were those were the trends for many, for many German Jews who were very comfortable to leave their Jewish communities for a variety of reasons, including the fact that after 1875, they could. Um, and that was novel. That was new. So I'll, I'll try to, to address what I think you're asking, Sam, um, and, and that is, you know, can it, can, it, can it happen here, or will it happen here? And my answer is no. And I'll even, I'll, I'll, even, I'll take the harder case. I won't do 2015, I'll do 2017. And I'll say that um, the, uh, the level of anti-Semitism in America is not worrisome. And let me, exp let me explain why. First of all, um, we have to get over the phenomenon of calling all, anti all, all dislike of Jews anti-Semitic. Not all dislike of Jews is anti-Semitic, and not all anti-Semitism is poised to cause serious harm to Jews. Germany obviously was the cla horrible classic, you know, Ger not even Germany, but, the, but what, what, what the Nazis did, the, the Shoah, clearly that was the height of anti-Semitism. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, that's one. My father being beat, beat up on the Lower East Side or and beating people back, he had, he had fights with Irish kids. He said, uh, he said almost every day, I'm not sure if that's true, but uh, that was anti-Semitic. And um, not being able to apply to certain, and with, with any reason to, of hope, 
to certain Ivy League universities in the 60s, for me, that was anti-Semitism. Um, today, um, the Jew Jews of America are the most admired religious group in the United States. N number one, um, uh, more you know, we we are the most um, successful uh, socioeconomically and politically well placed and culturally well placed uh, ethnic uh, ethnic group in the United States, bar none. Um, we used to be the number one group in terms of affluence and education, except there's, there's, there was this migration, may it continue, uh, from India um, that started in the 60s, but it was a very selective migration of highly skilled and highly educated people. So I think uh, recent reports show the, the um, Indian, uh, Indians in America are actually more, more affluent and more educated. But aside from them, we, we are the most educated and most affluent. And um, the type of anti-Semitism we see is not institutional, not political. Um, uh, Jew, the, uh, it's just a, an and the other, other thing is I learned this from Professor Ismar Shorsh. He taught me that, he said, you know, Germany was not the most anti-Semitic country at the time. It was Poland. And France was just as anti-Semitic as, as Germany. So, so you, you need, to, one, you need to look at anti, you know, anti-Semitic feeling but then you need to also try to understand um, uh, institutions, democracy. You know. And so, if you, so, so we need two ingredients, and, and then I'll hand it over to you. One is we need American democracy to be shattered. It's possible. We've got to fight against that. And the, um, and the other thing is we need to have Jews being, in a sense, you know, the premier minority group in the United States. But fortunately or unfortunately, we have a whole bunch of other minority groups way ahead of us. Um, uh, you know, Muslims being one of them, um, blacks being another, and as we, as we see in Hispanics. I mean, what, what country permits its government to abandon 3.2 million Hispanic cit citizens of the United States? It's, it's, that's phenomenal, you know, that's, that is frightening. You know, that's real, that's really anti-Hispanicism. Um, and, and so I think we're really very, very far from this. Anything could happen, I, I get all that, but, but we, we need, to, we need to, to, to take this seriously, to take it um, uh, within proportion. You know, I, I'm, I think about uh, Abba Iban, who spoke about us, and he said, we're the only people who can't take yes for an answer. So, um, so yes, America is indeed a welcoming place. We've got, we've got Soros, and we've got, we've got Gary Cohn, and we've got uh, Barbara Streisand, and we've got, we've got so many prominent, well-placed Jews. And I, I, I wonder what they said in Germany at the time. I, I know it sounds like that, but it, it's just inconceivable to me that we're talking about anything approaching, God forbid, God forbid, uh, the Shoah of the 1930s and 40s. Um. I want to tell a story. In 1989, I, when I was director of YIVO, I happened to be in Moscow uh, on YIVO business. And when I arrived, a Moscow uh, friend who picked me up at the airport said, there is a library working today, a, a Jewish library. This is a library that was in the home of one of the Aliyah activists. Uh, and people would get together and uh, uh, a speaker would be invited to speak about whatever Jewish topic. So I was the designated hitter that evening, and I spoke about the Evo Institute and the work we were doing in Vilna. And um, at the end of the evening, the uh, owner, the, uh, the person who lived in that apartment where the library was taking place, uh, uh, thanked everyone, thanked me, and uh, said good, good night. And then he invited me to sit down for a glass of tea and uh, further conversation after everybody else left. And um, as soon as I sat down, he started haranguing me that Jews in America have no future. That the only future for Jews in America is Aliyah. And uh, that if, if America, American Jews don't go on Aliyah, 
they will end up like German Jews ended up. And I said, my friend, uh, there are many reasons to go on Aliyah, but that is not one of them. And uh, I repudiate, I just totally rejected that point of view. Um, I wouldn't say that today I would accept that point of view by any means. Uh, I still uh, admire people who go on Aliyah and I still don't think that the imminent demise of American Jewry is a reason. But I, I have to think, I have to say that um, uh, in the past year, my confidence has been shaken. Um, it's not just that uh, uh, certain key institutions of our democracy, the judiciary, the press, have been vilified by the current president. Uh, it's that uh, journalists have gotten threats, uh, myself included, at my home. Um, and uh, they're not pretty and they evoke what happened in Germany, in Europe, quite literally. And uh, uh, I, I really still think of it as a marginal phenomenon. How many people are these white nationalists after all? But uh, the, the, the white nationalists have political backing in high places. They have allies among nationalists, let's call them, in European governments. Uh, there is even a government of uh, the Machane Halumi in Israel, the nationalist camp in Israel, uh, Lahavdil. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't go anywhere near Richard Spencer's vile words, but um, there, there is an affinity among some of the thinking of some of these people with one another. Uh, not to say that they are exterminationists or murderers or anything of the sort, but there is reason to worry about American democratic institutions. Uh, and uh, as we say in Israel, oy vavoy lanu, if that should come to pass. Oh, uh, woe will be to Jews if those democratic institutions are in fact weakened. Uh, do you think I'm exaggerating? <laughs> um, uh, no, as, as long, look, I, I heard you say, in a certain level, we agree. Um, uh, I was trying to say there is not a reasonable chance of anti-Semitic exterminationism or ex exterminist anti-Semitism. Is there a chance that Jews will be, have their lives restricted X number of years from now by cultural and social and political forces, yeah, but that's that's you asked me about Germany. This is, so that's not it's not Germany, and um, uh, and as I said, uh, the other th you know Ben Halpern wrote a famous book. Uh, it, was, it was an essay, America is different. You're the historian, yeah, 1956, which said basically you know the 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 Jews of Europe have a counterpart in the United States, and they're African Americans. Um, so, as I was trying to say, Jews are not the principal minority group in America. Um, but they, what, what, what was that poster? They, they came after the, the communists, and then we weren't worried, and then we came after the... the, the, the that was Niemöller. Niemöller. Right. That was, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, we're, we're, we're in the list. Mm -hmm. But, again, assessing it, you know, dispassionately, we're way down on the list in terms of, of minority groups. Um, uh, you know, Joel Lieberman did not hurt that ticket, and uh, you know, Michael Bloomberg, when Michael Bloomberg was thinking about running, hardly anybody said, "What? A Jew's going to run?" Like, it just was. It just wasn't there. So l let's um, let's be reasonable about about this about this issue, and let's not overplay it. I, I'd rather have Jews worried about American democracy and all the other things that you mentioned than discrimination against. 
immigrants and Hispanics and everything else. Um, and if we, and, if, and it's the old fashioned Jewish CRC approach. If we make sure America is a tolerant and democratic country, by deduction, Jews, Jews will be safer. Yeah. As a historian, uh, I, I can't, when I'm writing, or especially when I'm teaching, not think about the present day, right? I mean, if I, the other day, my students and I spent a lot of time talking about the refugee crisis, right, of 1938, 1939, and beyond. Of course, you know, we, um, we thought about today's moment in which we are living. Uh, what I was trying to say earlier is, I worry about these things, maybe because I'm an American Jew, maybe because I'm an American citizen, maybe because I'm a historian. I don't worry about present day United States um, and think mostly about the Jews and the worry about the Jews. I think my worry about the United States today is about the United States today. Um, and its total population, about, about all of its minorities, about the kids. I mean, I have lists of worries um, that keep me up at night. Uh, and, and it's partly why I do what I do. Um, I mean, you know, I teach history of mobility. I teach history of immigration, um, in part because I think these, are ex these undergraduates are the students who need to hear about what happened in Germany in the 1930s, who need to hear about what happened in Romania in the 1870s and 1880s, who need to talk about the Armenian, I mean, we need to have all of these conversations so that they can be better citizens. Um, so do I worry about the US? Yes. Do I worry about the US maybe because I know a lot about Germany? Yes. But am I worried about the Jews? I don't know that that's my number one worry <laughs> on my very large list. Final, final comment, and that is, uh, I think uh, I, I ask you to join me in thanking the Leo Beck Institute for uh, focusing our thinking on the, way, the ways in which this history pertains today. Uh, that was the theme of this uh, seven-part series. And um, I think thanks to uh, Steve and Robin, we've managed to uh, uh, make a contribution to that kind of thinking. And that's really the mission of Leo Beck, and I think we ought to be grateful. Thank you. would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.